7.45, time now for Peril and Privilege, conversations on masculinity. And we're joined live in studio this morning by Cleo Monago. Cleo is described as an innovative voice among African-American same-gender loving men. He founded the national body of the Black Men's Exchange, BMX, back in 1989, and it's a national organization that provides educational, empowerment, and wellness opportunities with a particular emphasis on same-gender loving and bisexual black males. Um, its mission to engage issues that impact the lives of diverse black men toward building self-esteem, respect, good health and community. Now BMX has served and impacted the lives of over 300,000 black men in the Bay Area, Los Angeles, New York City, Baltimore and Miami. Now Cleo also founded and is CEO of the African American Advocacy Support Services and Survival Institute known as AMASI. Uh, it's a national non-profit organization and from it he created the Amasi National Centers for Wellness and Health in order to provide HIV AIDS treatment and prevention services using a mental health model that was culturally specific to African American identity. The first opened in uh, Oakland and now there are centers in South Central Los Angeles, Atlanta, Georgia, and right here in Harlem, New York. Cleon Monago, live in studio. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for joining us. Um, so um, if we take a step back and ask you about your personal journey um, uh, in terms of that term, same gender loving, talk about how that personal journey impacted your choice to set up. The, uh, the Survival Institute and the Black Men's Exchange? Well, um, luckily, sometimes I say luckily, sometimes I say unfortunately, I was a very um, sensitive kid and a very analytical kid. And I always watched what was occurring around me with great focus and try to figure things out. And to be try to be clear, there was a lot of challenging and troubling things as a black person that were occurring around me in terms of how, how we referenced ourselves, some things we said about ourselves and put ourselves down, which started off with, you black, blah, 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 blah. Maybe you've heard those kind of things before. And I was very um, confused by those things in terms of, I saw them as being destructive. And many things I can get into, which maybe will come out of this conversation, that I just noticed as a young person that this was not we, this is not helpful and I didn't want to participate. At the same time, I, I don't want to participate in terms of perpetuating, I should say. I want to participate in terms of countering it or bringing attention to it toward managing and resolving those things. I also realized at a very young age that I was a same gender loving person and that we live in a society, regardless of our sexuality, that was not affirming of us. And there were concepts, both political, like gay and even democratic, republican, all kinds of things that were occurring in society that were offered to us as our only options that were not really affirming and that did not, did not provoke trigger us to be the best we could be as healthy black people. And so um, when we think about masculinity, and uh, it's, it's often heteronormative, uh, it's often defined as heterosexual, and there's a very narrow, um, specific focus around that. And now I talk often about um, emotional justice, mm -hmm. and that is the need to deal with the legacy of untreated trauma mm -hmm. as a result of just what it has meant to be African American and survive these 500 years, generation Absolutely. after generation after generation. And part of the inheritance of that, the battle to survive through slavery and Jim Crow and civil rights um, has been, yes, that warrior survival spirit, yes. but also the, the, the untreated trauma that has literally gone from uh, womb to child, womb to child, womb to child. Um, That's uh, exactly what I recognized as a kid that, yeah. that I could not get with and normalize and be complacent about. And so for you, knowing that you were same gender loving very young, um, how did you navigate um, your community uh, accepting you as that person? Or was that a very comfortable, easy journey for you? Well, at the risk of sounding strange, I didn't, didn't have a lot of investment in community acceptance. I thought the community was kind of crazy. Again, going back to the issues that you raised in terms of why the trauma issues, the destructive behaviors, the um, unattended to traumas that became culture and normalized, I couldn't get with it. So I um, did not use society or even my community as having enough credibility to question who I was at a very young age. So the lack of needing that approval, because I had an analysis of it that, didn't, that was not more important than me in terms of my self-concept, I was never really distracted in terms of getting to know myself and, and embrace myself because I did not use that as a source of 
frame of reference for me in terms of what, what, whether I was a good person or not. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So my journey was very independent as a young person because, as a matter of fact, I thought I was the only one on earth because I didn't know any other same living people. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. yeah, and it was kind of a, um, a place of... How um, young were you when you knew for yourself? Eight. Oh, eight, right. Yeah. And it was kind of a place to be outside of this society. I thought it was special. Um, and I didn't have any problems with it because, like I said, again, going back to the comparison issue, the contrast, I'm like, I, this, is, this is better than that, so I, I can handle this. So then in the creation of Amasi, um, what was it that said, okay, we need these um, mental health and culturally specific models to deal with these issues, to look at things, that, things like holistic health mm -hmm. um, in order to move forward, in order to do that healing work? Talk a bit about that. Well, one of the things that I noticed in the midst of examining and acknowledging the, the, the post-Trump traumatic behavior in our community was there was no solution. There was nothing in the landscape to address it. Um, I was a musician for a while, and I also worked simultaneously in community mental health. And I noticed that um, traditional community mental health systems were not built around the specifics of black life and culture or with specific attention to the trauma experience towards resolving that. Things were based on Freud and Jung and European experiences that made no mention or consideration of this, this particular experience. So when I attempted to bring in a black considerable lens into traditional mental health services, it didn't work. There was problems. I was getting fired. No kind of things was going on because those systems were resistant to making being black important enough to be a focus. So at the risk, at, in the process of trying to work in traditional systems and those things not working for myself personally as a professional or for my community, I decided to build something myself. And again, the Amasi Center is for everybody. It's for the whole community because the issues that we've talked about are relevant to the whole community in terms of a, a culture's or a people's trauma. So the organization was built to engage through different techniques and strategies and methodologies resolving that the issues relevant to that, that trauma as black people. And so one of the things I always believe is that when you do that kind of tran transformative work, mm -hmm. the visionary work, that you there are discoveries that you make about yourself through what you uh, encounter with other people. And I'm wondering about the kinds of discoveries that, that you made in working with black folks in developing those um, models that either moved you or changed you or surprised you or impacted you. Well, one of the things that surprised me in my young naivete when I first started in my early 20s was that I assumed that the worst I would experience would be disagreement maybe with people disagreeing, but I didn't realize I would experience in some cases such severe resistance. That I didn't fathom that as I would start developing my work. Um, and there's, there's people in our community who are very well assimilated and have learned to value, rather kills them, if you will, um, assimilating into the larger system even if it's blacklists, L-E-S-S -S in this instance. And so, as was, in my, I call it white accommodationist behavior. And my work is black affirming, which is not white accommodationist. It's not white attacking either, I wanna make that very clear. But in this culture, we've been trained that to be black affirming or pro-black is an anti-white reaction. And no it's, no, it's not. It's a pro-black, black affirming, black restor restorative reaction. But it's people in our community who don't realize that, who are, engulfed in white approval, like for example, this might sound like an extreme example, when you talk about the image of God or the image of Jesus, when you say that that person might not necessarily be white, but might be everything, or maybe a person that's black, if you look at Jesus and where they were from, there's resistance in our community because some of us have been very well acculturated into white accommodationist thinking. So I've dealt with some severe resistance to my work from, from that energy, and I didn't expect that. I, I didn't expect it to be such severe resistance in some cases. And so, um, so if it started off in 1989, you've had some, some years under your belt now. As you've moved forward, how have you um, chosen to navigate that kind of resistance? And once again, those folks, because all of us, when it comes to this emotional justice issue and dealing with that legacy of untreated, untreated trauma, it manifests itself in all kinds of ways. It could yes. be, it could, sometimes it could just be purely homo homophobic. And sometimes people's stances are contradictory. They may believe in the, in the importance of the work, but take issue with the person who's doing the work. They may want, the, they may want to benefit from the effort that the person has made, but take issue with the person who created the, the, the project in the first place. So there's a, sometimes a contradictory way in which we engage even our own healing. Well, that helps me to answer your question better. Um, I understand as a student of 
black trauma since I was a kid, an active acknowledger of this phenomena, not to be personally reactionary or abusive or combative to the extent that I can be. Sometimes just being a black male in a room is considered combative without even opening your mouth. But trying to get not be involved in that myself and, t- and turn people off or shut people down. Um, I understand so-called homophobia in the black community. I understand, from my perspective, black male disorientation, black male terror and fear, black male resistance to being compromised, being trained to think that a homosexual was an actually compromised male and not wanting no association in the desperate attempts to resurrect and restore and make black manhood powerful and using American patriarchy as a frame of reference. I understand all of that. I think I've been successful because as opposed to being reactionary, defensive, and, and cold, traumatizing in response to people resisting me, I say, I understand. I get it. I don't, of course, I don't have the same perspective of you in terms of being anti-homosexual, being a homosexual, but I can engage what you're talking about, and I'm also willing to create room to hear you and hear what, you got, what you're saying. But one thing I, I strongly request is respect. And if you don't have the capacity to be respectful, I think you have some issues personally to take a look at because being respectful is a sign of courage. And being disrespectful is often a sign of just the opposite. You can't handle the engagement, so you shut down. And so often when I put those kind of concepts on the table for consideration, people are willing to have a conversation, including people who have been historically very anti. Because most people's anti-other people perspective are based on myth often unaddressed myth. I mean, you, all, you often refer to the history of unaddressed trauma, Well, there's also the history of unaddressed myth and things that have become normalized and, and mistaken as fact because nobody has created space to address it. Well, I create a lot of space to, space to address things, including same-gender loving by Africans that tend not to have been addressed that much. And I understand it, so I don't react like, oh my God, and, and, or, or F you, or some type of, you know, cold traumatizing reaction. It's very important to be strategically focused and calm in how you deal with people who have been traumatized. And so then as we um, close, um, you are a, a builder and a creator and a visionary, no question about that in terms of the work that you do. What's your next, um, when you think about the next place where you need to kind of target your lens and think about where the work needs to be, what does that look like for you? Well, the next part of my work, which I'm excited about, there's two. One is doing writing books. And the other is getting involved in film. Um, film is one of the most powerful mediums in this society, and I want to ex- explore that more in terms of bringing these issues to the film landscape for, for community-wide engagement. So then if folks would like to learn more about all of your projects from Amasi, the Black Men's Exchange, let them know some places where they can contact you, the website, all that good stuff. Okay, well, Amasi, the whole name is Amasi Centers for Wellness, Education, and Culture. You can get us at www.amasi.com. Amasi is A-M-A-S-S-I. The Black Men's Exchange is bmxnational.com. You can reach us on, by email at bmxnational at gmail.com.